Good morning, everyone, or good day, wherever you may be. I'm Mike O'Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, and I have the distinct privilege and honor today of hosting a conversation with my good friend, uh, the Honorable Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, the 27th Secretary of Defense in the United States, who, of course, served uh, as Secretary of the Army as well in the Trump administration and uh, did really that whole four-year stint. Uh, Mark Esper is a soldier hailing from the great state of Pennsylvania, went to West Point, spent about a decade in active service and another decade in reserve component service. Uh, is also a longstanding uh, resident of Washington with many experiences and jobs, but he's not a creature of Washington. I consider him a, a hero of the heartland. In addition to his Pennsylvania background, his congressional experience was with some of the great senators and great states of our nation like Tennessee and Nebraska in his service with uh, for example, Senator Frist and Senator Hagel at that time. He's also worked in industry, which is such a crucial part of our defense establishment in the United States. He's also worked on the US-China Economic and Security uh, Commission, which has been so important in understanding the rise of China in modern times. And so his wealth of experience and background is, in addition to his background as a soldier, just uh, provides a great wealth of experience and perspective that the nation benefited from. I wanna thank him personally and publicly for his service in these uh, last four years, but his entire career during particularly difficult and challenging times. And he's always handled himself with such integrity and honor and, uh, and I'm grateful as an American and as a friend. So Secretary Esper, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to the conversation. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and thank you for the very kind and uh, generous introduction. I, I think that means I owe you lunch now or something uh, once COVID lifts. So, yeah, and, and we're not you. too far. We're not too far apart. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, although we realize friends and colleagues are around the world in this conference, and what we want to talk about today primarily is the overall national defense strategy that Secretary Esper had such a hand in contributing to in its conceptualization when he was Secretary of the Army. And then after Secretary of Mattis's tenure, of course, uh, Mark Esper was the main driver of that overall strategy at the DOD level writ large. And of course, that strategy has implications for the Middle East. So what we thought we would do by way of conversational flow is begin big and broad and ask Secretary Esper to just outline the two or three most important elements of that strategy. I'm sure many listeners are familiar, but just to hear it from him, but also which parts of the strategy he felt most able to implement in the year and a half he was Secretary of Defense and the two years before that when he was Secretary of the Army, where we still have a lot of work to do. So that's a big set of questions, uh, Secretary Esper, but let me please put that before you just to frame the national defense strategy as you would like as the first part of our conversation. Well, thank you very much, Mike. So let's begin with the national defense strategy. The, the NDS is what we call it in, for shorthand. So released in January, 2018, uh, when I became SecDef in July, 2019, I made clear that my number one priority would be impl implementing the NDS. And uh, we know what the NDS said. What, it's, what it asserted was that we were now in an era of great power competition uh, with near peer rivals such as China and Russia, but it also recognized the fact that we still had to deal with rogue states such as North Korea and Iran, and of course, the enduring threat of terrorism. Uh, part of that strategy also talked about the atrophy in our armed forces, a two-decade focus on low-intensity conflict, and the need to shift back to put more emphasis on high-intensity conflict, to modernize the force, and to do any number of things to make sure that we're prepared for the challenges of the 21st century. So I made that my priority. In my first couple months in office, I think it was October 2019, I sat down with all my senior leaders, civilian and military alike. And what we did was uh, building upon three lines of effort, line of effort in one, building a more lethal and ready military, line of effort two, strengthening our, our alliances and growing our partnerships. And then line of effort number three, reforming the, the DOD so we can, in my words, um, uh, uh, turn, reap investments in time, money, and manpower and put it back into those top, top priorities. What we did from those three lines of effort was come up with 10 uh, objectives and each of those had some objectives which ranged from everything from focus of the Department on China to updating our war plans for Russia and China, implementing new concepts such as uh, the immediate response force uh, and dynamic force employment, things that are relevant to the Middle East. Um, we talked about repositioning forces, another important 
uh, matter for our footprint in the Middle East, and all the way through down to establishing a new joint warfighting concept that would lead to doctrine. So very clear uh, objectives with metrics and timelines. And I was pleased to report last summer that we had made very, very good progress on each and every one of them, but there's always work to be done. And this is gonna be, this is a generational shift for the United States military, one that needs to continue. The challenge here, and I'll relate it to your question, Mike, up front is clearly uh, we need to focus on China. I mean, that in, in and of itself was, was one of a top 10 objective. But uh, we have to deal with the world we live in, not, not the world we want or not the world we think it will be next year, 10 years from now or 30 years from now. And so what that means is we still have to address the challenges that we face coming out of Pyongyang or Tehran or other places around the world. And that gets to you know, the conversation today. It gets to the challenges uh, facing the Biden administration in their first four weeks of office now. And so um, that said, I'll just, I'll, I'll, last thing I will, I will state is this. Uh, I was pleased to, to hear you know, Secretary Austin come in and both he and Deputy Secretary Kathix talk about China remaining our pacing challenge, if you will. And I think that's important. I, I think it shows the continuity in, in national security policy uh, that both Republicans and Democrats and defense and security professionals, you know, in office, out of office have taken with regard to that. So strong bipartisan support behind the national defense strategy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the new administration will take a look at it and, and update it, fine tune it, make adjustments. That's, that's good. That's what they should do. Uh, but it's good to see that we have continuity because that type of continuity and predictability is important for the defense establishment. Uh, but also for our allies and partners, and in many ways for our potential adversaries. Well, thank you. And I want to ask you in a minute about, again, applying the national defense strategy logic to the Middle East, including on the force posture sure. and basing questions. But before I get to that, I know that one other thing that you really emphasized that's obviously essential in defense strategy is modernization of technology. And of course, China is the pacing threat. And as you well know, that's also led to a lot of discussion in the United States about hypersonic weapons and artificial intelligence and a lot of the areas we feel that we are in direct competition with China. But from a Middle Eastern point of view, one could argue that some of the uh, traditional technologies of missile defense, of anti-submarine warfare, and, and maybe you know, cruise missile defense, some of the defensive technologies where we, we have vulnerabilities that have been hard to completely address in modern decades, that those might be at least as important as hypersonic missiles or artificial intelligence. How do you look at our current state of modernization, including not only new offensive capabilities, but potentially new defensive capabilities? How's that going? And where do you see the greatest need for further progress? Yeah, very good points. So modernization is, is a key part of this. In many ways, the military, certainly the Army, where when I was Secretary of the Army, was living off the Reagan era defense buildup. So the, the same top six defense or top five defense weapon systems of the Reagan era had been upgraded over decades and we were still using them. So clearly we needed to update the services. Uh, you know, I, I presented a, the, the, a new blueprint for the future Navy Battle Force 2045, which called for a combination of manned and unmanned ships. So each of the services needs to modernize. We also need to build out our cyber and space capabilities and do some other things. With regard to the technologies, we had identified 11 top tier technologies. Uh, I always put AI as number one, but that we also have to deal with robotics and autonomy, directed energy. All these things we need in the future to deal with the most dangerous threats. And it's important how I use these words, the most dangerous in, in, the, in the sense that Russia and China pose existential threats to the United States. But arguably, the more likely ones would, would come out of North Korea and Iran. And you made the case uh, you know, just now. If, I had to, if you said right now, today, Secretary Esper, if you had to have you know, one weapon system or more of one system in the Middle East, would it be? Uh, hypersonics or air defense, I would probably choose air defense because of the substantial missile buildup uh, uh, conducted by Iran over the previous decades presents a real threat to our allies and partners in the region. So air defense is important. It's, it's also important, if not more important for the Russians and Chinese. Um, but it's not just a matter of technology of quality. It's a matter of quantity as well, particularly when you're dealing with you know, large inventories of missiles. I mean, this is a, a, a big reason why the United States and its NATO allies left the INF Treaty. It wasn't just because Russia had been cheating for many years, it was be, and had developed a capability that could threaten uh, our NATO partners, but we knew that the Chinese, 
um, had developed uh, well over a thousand intermediate range and other range missiles that could threaten our uh, allies and partners in U.S. forces in the in the eastern Pacific. I'm sorry, Western Pacific. So uh, those are just some of the factors that when you try and build the future military, and I was focused on the future, uh, you have to put all these considerations and take them all into account. So now if we could turn to the U.S. military footprint in the broader Middle East, and I know, again, as secretary, you were very cognizant of the importance of rethinking even modest-sized deployments because you knew you had to be a good custodian of the taxpayer's dollar, and also the size of the military wasn't growing much, even as these new responsibilities and new obligations were becoming more difficult in many places. In regard to the Middle East, even though the numbers are formally classified, and I'm not going to ask you to confirm any of them here. Uh, nonetheless, we know from press reports that we've got roughly a couple thousand troops in Turkey, maybe close to a thousand in Syria, around 3,000, 2,500 in Iraq, and then several thousand each in most of the GCC countries, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar. We've got more in Saudi than we used to because of the threat from the air uh, and from missile and drone attack. And of course, we've got about now 2,500 forces still in Afghanistan. Then if you want to include Diego Garcia and Djibouti, that rounds out the broader picture, at least as I define it. How would you advise um, a you know, new Biden administration and the Austin Pentagon to think about options for recalibrating, maybe streamlining some of that presence? Well, look, they, they have a lot, lot of smart people on their team. They see the facts probably, I think, the same way uh, I do. I've had a conversation with, uh, with some of them. Uh, let, let's, let's look at the big picture. Uh, we had three good years of spending under the Trump administration, uh, supported by Congress to increase the defense budget. And that really made a difference with regard to our readiness, uh, whether it was any of the services, but also making these initial investments in the weapon systems that you were talking about or the technologies. But look at where we sit today. Um, we, we are facing, uh, and I just looked at this the other day, a $28 trillion debt. It's 129% of GDP. And uh, we're gonna have to deal with that. The, these, these chickens have been coming home to roost now for quite some time. So, so what folks are talking about on the Hill, and I hope it's wrong, is a, 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 at best a flat defense budget, if not cutting you know, money out of it. I was a big believer that we needed to maintain that three to 5% um, you know, annual real growth. I think that's important if you're gonna, if you're going to continue to modernize the military and prepare for the future. And we can afford that as a country, but we have to deal with these larger issues with regard to the budget, the debt, the deficit, et cetera. So that said, uh, if, you, if your basis is that your defense budget isn't getting much better and, and you have the forces available to you that you have available to you, and you need to also, you know, reposition your foothold, uh, reposition yourself in the Indo-Pacific, uh, because I think that needs to happen as well. Then you've got to, you have to be able to pull forces from somewhere else, either return to the United States to, to refit, retrain, be ready to move out more quickly, or reposition them in those areas where you of, of greatest concern. And that's where I'd begun these COCOM reviews. And we had gone at least one or two rounds with all of them to look at that. Um, clearly, Central Command was a, was a focus. And we have tens of thousands of troops there. Um, you know, clearly we have a mission in Afghanistan that drives that, but uh, you know, my view, and we talked a little bit about this beforehand, my first experience in the Middle East was when I deployed there as an infantry officer in 1990 for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And at that time we had a very small footprint. Uh, of course, for the war, we built it up. But as I look at it now, so many factors have changed. You know, US dependence on Gulf oil is 50% of what it used to be. Uh, we're now a net exporter as a country. Uh, so some of those factors have changed, right? We no, have, no longer have the threat of Iraq that we had uh, during my time. Uh, now, Iran is the principal challenge that we face in terms of containing Iranian bad behavior, deterring them from doing what they're doing. So, so th that has changed. What, so what I had put in place uh, in the past year, though, was a series of adjustments to our, to our footprint that will continue to bring the force structure down over time. You know, we're 2,500 now in Iraq. We could go lower, you know, not just because we can, but because the, because the Iraqis have made such good progress with regard to developing their own forces. And I think there are other places where we can reduce as well without changing our, our capability with relying on more concepts like dynamic force employment. But at the same time, we need to take a look at that, uh, that architecture of bases running up, you know, from the GCC countries up into Iraq 
and think about how do we consolidate and then how do we gain, gain more operational depth? You know, how do we, how do we shift further West? How do we make sure that we are less vulnerable than, than what we need to be? There are a number of adjustments like that we need to make strategically to not just protect us from, um, you, you know, a belligerent Iran, but also allow us to free up troops and uh, allow us better access into the theater and then really focus on how do we apply them uh, consistent with the NDS. I wanted to ask also about naval presence in the region. And of course, this is one where we've noted historically that people, Americans and others who are based in the region or who are responsible for the region tend to always want that carrier close by. And yet we also know that starting with Secretary Mattis early in the NDS period, uh, we were hoping to be strategically predictable, but operationally unpredictable to coin a phrase that he used mm -hmm. and that you probably contributed to creating. And also that the Persian Gulf waters may not be the best place for a big naval asset. And uh, so I wondered if you wanted to comment on how important it is to have a continuous naval presence in any given location, or should we try to be a little bit more flexible and expansive in how we think about naval capability and not worry each and every time we may have a, a, a short gap or a different kind of asset deployed rather than a carrier battle group? Sure, well, let's go back to first principles. And I would say a first principle of the United States foreign policy has always been, how do we maintain freedom of commerce, freedom of navigation, whether it's the Persian Gulf or the Taiwan Strait, you name it. Uh, I, I think we need to be consistent with that and ensure that, uh, that we can maintain the, the, the openness of those waterways, that the commercial traffic can, can move through the Gulf unfettered by the threat of Iranian gunboats or, or whoever else for that matter. But I think it's a shared responsibility. And I think what we need to see is more of our allies and partners and, and certainly those countries, many European countries who, who rely a good deal on commerce, particularly the flow of oil coming through that region to step up more with their naval forces to assist in that. So I I don't think it's, you know, I think the United States uh, burden can shift some on that. And that would allow us to free up naval forces to put in, you know, for example, the Indo-Pacific or other places. Uh, plus, we need to look at, you know, the, 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 the Navy needs to improve its readiness with regard to getting, you know, ships into maintenance on time and out of maintenance on time. And that gets to the particular point about the aircraft carriers. carriers. Uh, you're right, everybody wants one, but there are other ways to demonstrate presence. There are other ways to, to uh, have a capability to de that, that will deter others. Um, you mentioned strategic predictability, operational unpredictability. The way we made that real is through dynamic force employment. And so once I changed the, uh, how, we, uh, how we operationalized our bomber fleets about a year ago or eight months ago, it freed up the bomber force to do dynamic force employment. So you're seeing a lot more use of B-52s, for example, uh, flying into Europe or flying into the Middle East to, to show United States commitment to, to deter bad behavior. So I think we need, we need to think, continue to think along those lines more creatively about that. And look, um, I, I also think that uh, the, the locus, the center of gravity, if you will, in this region has arguably shifted out of the Persian Gulf and more into the Indian Ocean. Uh, I, I think that it gives us more flexibility, more freedom of maneuver. And we, we should think about, and this is one of the taskings I had put out to the chain of command, is how do we think about shifting that locus so that we have more of that flexibility, more of that freedom of maneuver, to then, therefore just not deal with the threats inside the Persian Gulf, but the challenges we face just beyond in the Indian Ocean, whether it's you know the Chinese who are, who are demonstrating a much bigger uh, um, presence in the region. So I think over time, we need to kind of make these shifts uh, to recognize where the future is, where we need to go, and the, and the big challenges we see, again, consistent with the NDS. And while we're thinking about how to conceptualize the theater, I know that on your watch, we've now changed where Israel fits in the combatant command map. And of course, historically, it was affiliated with European command from an American military liaison point of view, but now it's been sort of brought into its more natural geographic home anyway, in Central Command. Could you comment on the rationale for that and the pros and cons of the decision as you saw it? Yeah, we actually began thinking about this uh, about a year ago uh, in the wake of, um, you know, our conflict with our, our brief confrontation with Iran about how do we improve our worst of fighting stance in the region. So one of the things was, for example, how do we reduce the, the presence of dependence in the region? 
because they're they are vulnerable in this uh, in this period of increased tensions. But how do we make sure that going forward that we can improve our operational capabilities? And, and we have some core principles in the military, right, such as unity of command, unity of effort. And it just didn't make sense where we were today with the um, with the warming of relations, if you will, uh, between Israel and some of its uh, 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 Arab uh, neighbors in the region. And so we started asking ourselves and talking to friends and allies, you know, what is the impact of moving uh, Israel out of the UCOM AOR and into the CENTCOM AOR? And of course, you know, General McKenzie was supportive of it. I had discussions with my Israeli counterparts. Uh, State was, uh, Secretary Pompeo was on board. And what really gave it a boost was the Abraham Accords. I think that, uh, you know, very successful effort coming out of the White House uh, really kind of gave additional boost to the concept. And so we moved forward on it in, in the fall and, um, you know, put the paperwork in and, and got everybody aligned. And I think at this point it was eventually signed, but it made a whole lot of sense uh, because whether it's Israel or any one of the Arab partners in the region, uh, the biggest threat to them, to us, is Iran, is a, is a belligerent Iran, uh, c- continue to conduct its malign behavior throughout the region. And uh, the more that we can work together in terms of dealing with that threat, deterring it, containing it, the better we were. And bringing Israel into the fold just makes a whole lot of operational sense. And we had, again, the time had come to do that. Um, and, uh, and I think th- there's been really no aftershocks from it as well. So I think that kind of proved the point. So now coming back to the Western part of the theater, I know that your last trip as Secretary of Defense was to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, if I recall correctly. And I know that must've been a fascinating experience. And I just wondered, also speaking of the Abraham Accords as they involved Morocco, I wondered if you wanted to comment on what you took away from that trip and how the world looks from that side of the broader region. Sure, it was, uh, you know, uh, I, I traveled there in, in the fall to Malta, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, and it was, uh, it was a great trip. I had a chance to meet with uh, the, the, the leaders of each of the countries and their ministers of defense and to really get a good appreciation for how they saw the world. And it's, it's a very interesting nexus, right, because they, 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 they have one, one foot in Europe. They have, uh, you know, obviously they're in Africa, but they had the perspective of Africa and AFRICOM. Uh, but yet they look a lot toward the Middle East and what's happening there, given, you know, the history, the religion and everything else. So uh, a, a crossroads of three different continents and religions and everything else. And uh, I got a lot of good insights. And, it, you know, again, it convinced me the importance of growing partners, enabling partners like those three countries to really um, to really help shape the, a positive environment where, you know, we follow the international rules and norms where uh, where we have allies and partners to help us. Deal in this case, uh, you know, the challenges we faced there was with you know the the threat of terrorism. Uh, they're very concerned about mass migrations coming up, moving into Europe, and uh, and they face terrorism threats as well. And they see what's happening in the Sahel uh, in, in in Western Africa. So very interesting trip. But it was uh, given that they're situated on the African continent, the degree to which they paid attention to what was happening in the Middle East was 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 really eye opening. I'm going to start to bring in some audience questions now in the second half of our conversation. I've still got a couple of my own, but I'll weave those in. And one is put uh, very, very um, colorfully, so I will take the liberty of just reading it to you. Uh, For the Honorable Secretary Esper, to your eternal credit, um, you kept the Mattis National Defense Strategy energy up, and you avoided the not invented here problem. Although actually, of course, you were part of the team that came up with it, but, uh, but it's still true. And I take the point that uh, a lot of secretaries feel the need to make some abrupt change and, and you preserved a lot of what you agreed with. But now to continue with the question, but the Pentagon was slow to respond and remain so. What advice do you have for Secretary of Defense Austin to keep the pressure on a recalcitrant Pentagon bureaucracy to respond to this typical strategic shift? Well, thanks. I'll take that as a compliment because uh, uh, you're, you're right. I mean, obviously, I was in the building when it was being crafted, and uh, and it uh, and to me, when it came out in January 2018, I thought the biggest thing I could do was implement it. We, we hadn't seen much momentum on that front, and I was a believer in it. And uh, look, I could look at any strategy, and, and this one, and I, there are things that that uh, that you can improve upon or change. And eventually, we did actually through the process, but. 
I, I didn't see any need in terms of opening up the NDS and taking six or eight months to, to rewrite it just so it had my personal fingerprints on it. We didn't need that. We needed predictability. And I thought it was a very strong document to begin with. And, um, and, and I suspect as, as the new team reads it, they will largely agree, but again, they got to, it is a new administration. So they're going to put their fingerprints on it. Uh, the challenge is for any administration. And I've talked to my predecessors about this is how do you get the Pentagon bureaucracy to move? Um, part of it is people just are reluctant to change and don't want to change. In, in some cases they're protecting their own, you know, their own turf, their own piece of the budget, whatever the case may be. And that's not, by the way, it's not just when we say the Pentagon, it's not just the building. It's, it's everything from the services to the combatant commands uh, to, to the fourth estate, to all these different players. And in some cases, they are enabled by the Congress. And that's a challenge. And so um, and we, in the context of, you, you know, supporting civilian leadership, I think the, you know, I, I think the new team will take a look at the NDS. Uh, they'll make adjustments as they, as they should, as they rightly see it, based on the priorities set forth by the president. And then I think, um, you know, what you got to do, what I try to do is, if you want to affect change in large organizations, particularly there's none larger than the Pentagon, is you got to get involved. You got to get your hands dirty and spend a lot of time on it. You know, I, I spent week after week my first three or four months in office just to find nearly six billion dollars in savings. And it takes that type of involvement if you're going to affect change and just staying on top of people. And so we you know, I had those top 10 objectives as part of the NDS. And we did. We got a lot done in terms of moving that needle forward. But you can't do it in 18 months. Uh, it, it takes it takes years of effort. You've got to put the budget behind it. You've got to put your personal political capital behind it. And you got to get the Hill on, on board also. And that's maybe the, a, a bigger challenge in many ways. But it just takes that personal leadership, time and attention to do that amidst everything else that's going on. And that's obviously that's the a challenge I faced is you have a busy world out there and every day you're facing new events. But I try to stay focused to dedicate a little bit of every day uh, to how, how can I move the NDS forward? How can I, because I thought it was so important to the future of our nation's security to, to effect that change. So while we're on the NDS, and I'm gonna come back in a minute to a question about Syria policy from a Turkish colleague. And so we'll get into that in just a second, but you've already talked about China a bit this morning, but we haven't really talked much about Russia and yet the NDS does. The NDS, to my <laughs> mind, puts China and Russia on a nearly equal plane. You've mentioned that China is the pacing threat in terms of resources and technology and size, presumably. But of course, Russia has 5,000 nuclear weapons and uh, has also a big interest in the broader Middle East historically and today. So I wanted to ask how you thought about Russia. And uh, rather than just that, that's a huge subject, huge question. So let me put a little finer point on it, but I invite you to go wherever you wish. Um, while I'm concerned about Russia's behavior in, and its presence in Syria and Libya and perhaps uh, Egypt and perhaps elsewhere, I also feel that there's been some progress from a US and NATO perspective in at least stabilizing our deterrent posture in Eastern Europe. That may not extend all the way to the Middle East, but it may in a broader sense help stabilize US-Russia relations somewhat. Do you share my view that as troubling as the relationship with Russia still is, that there's a little bit more stability, at least in the eastern flank of NATO. And while that doesn't solve the challenge that Russia may pose to our interests in the Middle East, it's at least one step forward in the broader national defense strategy implementation. Yes, yeah, so again, st stepping back, so when I look at the, 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 those top tier near peer threats, I, I always prioritize China. Why? Because I look at the, the size of China, 1.4 billion people. I look at their economic growth. I look at the fact that they're now the second largest economy in the world. I look at all these things, all the natural resources they bring to bear, and I compare it with Russia, and I see in many cases just the opposite. And the NDS talks about this to some degree. I think uh, in, in the near term, both countries are on par with one another. As, as you rightly said, uh, Russia has far more nuclear weapons, uh, probably a more capable military in terms of their ability to conduct combined arms operations and project forces. But I think that fades over time, time being 10 or 15 years, while China continues its ascent. And, and by the way, I'm not yet prepared to call China a threat. Uh, I may sometimes you know, slip and use that because it's the lexicon that I grew up with, but I don't yet see China a threat. They don't need to be a threat. Much of that will, be, will depend on how we deal with China and how we deal with China with our allies and partners. 
clearly we all need to get on the same sheet of music and get China back into the or into the fold with regard to, you know, uh, living by international rules and norms and, uh, and not bullying their neighbors and doing all these bad things that they're doing now. But back to Russia. You know, clearly Russia has played a, a, a weak hand pretty well the past 10 or 15 years, and they've been very aggressive. We, we saw what they did with their annexation of uh, Crimea, you know, the invasion into eastern Ukraine, uh, Georgia. We can go around the world. I, I mean, the Baltics are very concerned uh, about what was happening. And so I, I do think it's the good news is that the NATO allies have come around to recognize that we now deal with a more belligerent or more, I should say, more aggressive Russia. And I think the fact that over the past few years, they've increased considerably their defense spending. Uh, now, of course, it needs to be focused really on modernization and readiness. And we're not quite there yet. You know, General Walters, the, the shape commander, has done a, a really good job in bringing that along. We try to do that in NATO. But we still need a, too many too many allies are spending not enough money on defense. And to really deter Russian bad behavior, bad behavior, you need that. And and as you know, I, I was looking uh, in the context of instructions I got from the White House to move more of our forces further east, right, to the frontline states and, and, and less in depth in, uh, in Central Europe. And so I thought that was important because we have some really nervous allies in the Baltics, Poland. And of course, I also tra I traveled to you know, those countries. I traveled to Bulgaria and Romania on a couple of occasions. So the flanks are where I'm particularly concerned. And I think the one area that we've got to keep a careful eye on is the Black Sea, uh, because you have, you know, you have Russia there, Turkey, uh, a confluence of things are happening in the Black Sea. We have a naval presence. And so the, the flanks are what always concern me most. Uh, the flanks, again, being the Baltics and then down in Bulgaria and Romania along the Black Sea. And we have to continue to, to, to unify NATO, increase our defense spending, improve our readiness and, and look at things differently. We cannot remain static. If we remain static, then we're going to fall behind. We're going to miss the future. So that leads now to the question from the audience about Turkey and Syria. And, uh, you know, I feel almost a little bad trying to solve this problem or ask you to solve it in a uh, hour long conversation. David Petraeus called Syria the, I think, strategic Chernobyl of our time for the sheer complexity of the problem. And to your credit and that of Secretary Austin, uh, when he was at CENTCOM, but also his successor um, and General Dunford, General Milley, President Trump, President Obama, ISIS was defeated. The caliphate was eradicated and that's no mean feat and it took some doing and uh, that's a huge accomplishment. On the same, by the same uh, token, however, we also know that President Assad remains in power in Syria. There's no realistic probability of his being removed that I can see and there remains a terrorist threat in part of Northwestern Syria in particular, and certainly an unsettled US presence in the Northeast where we've tried to work with uh, Kurds that we consider allies, but that our Turkish ally considers affiliated with terrorists uh, because of their cross-border links to the PKK inside of Turkey. And uh, as you can imagine, the question from our Turkish colleague had to do with how do we define who's a terrorist if we're prepared to work with Kurdish allies, and how do we ensure that any cooperation we have that's ongoing in Northeast Syria not somehow spill over into allowing the YPG in Syria, the Turkish group there, to support the PKK in Turkey, which many Turks tell us is actually one in the same organization, or at least the, the ties are so close that there's really no way to distinguish. So how do we ultimately uh, address this contradiction, if you will, uh, that maybe in the short term, we needed to work with the Kurds in Syria to defeat ISIS, but now we're sort of stuck, uh, affiliated with a group that we may feel loyalty to, but our Turkish allies consider essentially an enemy. It's a big question. Uh, I don't know if you have any wisdom you'd wanna convey on that. Well, I thought you might give me an easier question like solving Middle Mideast peace. Exactly. Uh, well, it's so complicated and it goes back hundreds of years, this, this issue between you know, Turkey and uh, its relationship with its neighbors. And uh, I mean, it, it's just a very complicated, complex problem. And quite honestly, you can spend a lot of time um, uh, focusing on this and missing the bigger picture. And I know it's a big picture issue for Turkey. I get it. I understand that. And, you know, we have a small footprint in Syria now to ensure that ISIS doesn't return and it's been effective. It's been a, a low cost investment, but 
I, I wouldn't go any further than what we are now in terms of in terms of that issue or getting involved in that. I think we have bigger issues to deal with. And um, if not, we find ourselves frittered away all around the world in these in these in, in these you know isolated issues that are important to partners and allies, but we have to put them in the context of other things. You know, if you were asking me my my concern uh, to, to talk about an issue I'm concerned about Turkey, it's not that. I'm concerned about Turkey's role in NATO and, uh, you know, how, how they are working together with the United States and other, other, other NATO allies to really uh, ensure that the alliance is as firm as it could be. We've had in many ways uh, NATO, play, I'm sorry, Turkey playing a spoiler role, right? It's, it's acquisition of the S-400 from Russia. It's, um, you know, it's in, in, confronting, if you will, maybe too strong of a word, French warships in the Med. It's, it's uh, friction with the Greeks. I mean, that's what I get concerned about and not, you know, this small corridor in the Northeast, uh, in Northeast Iraq with uh, Syria and all that. And uh, this ongoing issue between the PKK and the YPG and stuff like that. Again, that's important. It needs to be dealt with. But I think there are bigger issues out there for the United States and Turkey to deal with rather than, than this specific one. One follow up. Do you think there is a way that we can somehow mitigate this Turkish concern? This, in fact, does our very presence and collaboration with the YPG potentially give us some transparency, some eyeballs on what's going on and some leverage to try to discourage the YPG from playing any supporting role towards the PKK? Again, I, I think we have to you know, address probably the bigger issues with uh, you know, Turkish governance, uh, how they deal with these issues. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not prepared to offer any solutions today about this. I, again, I know it's important to Turkey, uh, but I, I think there are bigger issues there. And this is not a matter that's going to be solved um, by the United States. It's, it, it, it's, it's a very complex, complicated, historical, social, cultural problem. So just a couple more questions as we look to wrap up here pretty, pretty soon. And uh, this also is a complicated question of sort of political military interaction with the broader Middle East region. But as you know, the United States has longstanding and important relationships with Egypt and with Saudi Arabia, two of the huge countries of the region. And yet both of these relationships are under considerable scrutiny uh, in the case of Egypt, of course, because of the strong arm rule of President Sisi. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, even again this week with the new findings on uh, Saudi complicity in the killings of Jamal Khashoggi uh, two and a half years ago. This is a longstanding debate about how does the United States maximize its influence with countries like that, countries where we have important overlapping interests, but we don't approve of everything they do with their governments. Do you have any insights from your experience about how we can best influence those two countries in particular? Is there any levers uh, or any ways of working with them and, you know, quietly or publicly that can give some hope for progress? Over. Yeah, I, 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 like, to, I like to say, I, I said this, I think at my, my uh, confirmation here in, in July of 2019, that we, we are best when we lead with our values and uh, those values of human rights and freedom of the press and freedom of religion and, and you know, treating people properly. All those things that, again, are common threads in U.S. history, U.S. foreign policy, they go all the way back to our Constitution. I, I think we're strongest when we lead with our values. So we clearly need to engage these countries. They are partners. Uh, we should never set aside our values. We should have frank, candid conversations with them, certainly in private and sometimes in public. And we should begin there. On the other hand, if we apply, if we turn these values into a litmus test, we'll find that uh, we'll have fewer and fewer friends around the world. So I think our challenge is to figure out how to do that in a way that we can uh, work with them, uh, help, help them get to where we would like them to be. Uh, and at the same time, making sure that we're taking our national interests in concern as well. You know, Egypt has a very capable military and, um, and uh, we need, we, they, they use a lot of American uh, uh, equipment. We've trained with them in the past. We have U.S. forces in Egypt uh, under the MFO. So we just can't walk away. We shouldn't walk away. Uh, we need to continue to work with them. Uh, my concern with Egypt is that uh, for one reason or another, we can discuss why, but you know, they're turning more to the Russians to get their equipment. And that's not a good 
turn for us. We need them in our orbit, if you will. The same thing with the Saudis, uh, you know, more so for any number of reasons. Um, you know, if I had to ask you know, for the Saudis, you know, uh, I think what we need from them and for the other Arab states uh, on the Arabian Peninsula is to stop this, this fighting, these issues between them, whether it's the rift, you name it. They need, we need to focus on the bigger challenge. And the bigger challenge facing all of them and Israel and other partners in the region is Iran. But instead, we're, they're caught up in you know, squabbling over this issue or that issue. And uh, for all of them, I think the bigger, the bigger thing would be for us to all work together to deal with the bigger challenges we face in the region. And then, you know, there are other issues we could talk about with the Saudis. I, I think they need to continue to work on their own readiness. Uh, all the countries need to build, build out their own capacity when it comes to uh, their armed forces, all those things that will allow us to deter Iranian bad behavior going forward. So just two final questions to wrap up here, one on Afghanistan and then one from the audience that just came in on the issue of US nuclear command and control and how we handle uh, the chain of command, uh, an issue that came up in recent weeks in the United States. But on Afghanistan, uh, again, you managed a, a process that was tumultuous at times, but seems to have left us in a place where, you know, the, our fingers are in the dikes in a few different places, but the situation is sort of holding. But the overall trend line seems unfavorable militarily in terms of the levels of violence, in terms of the amount of the country that the Afghan government with modest NATO support is able to sustain control over. It's not as if anybody's on the brink of, you know, being overrun tomorrow from what I can see, but I would be curious as to how you see the Afghanistan mission today. And are we essentially, um, as some of my colleagues, uh, not myself, but some of my colleagues argue, essentially on an inevitable downward path towards defeat someday, unless the peace process pulls out a, a rabbit from the hat, or do you think that the military situation is more or less stable? And even though it's way too violent and regrettable, deeply tragic, it's more or less one that the Afghan government can continue to hold on to with just a few thousand US and NATO troops there. So I, I would say this much, we've been in conflict in, in Afghanistan now for 20 years, 21, going on 21 years. Uh, I, I think most people would agree at this point in time, the only way forward really is through a political process where both parties sit down and, and work it out and come up with a way forward. And that's why I supported the peace agreement put forward by a state department. And, uh, you know, look, it wasn't perfect. Some would say it wasn't great. And I would say it was good enough. And despite, you know, the ups and downs, the bumps, the, you know, the turns in the road, we, we do have a situation now, at least we, we did a couple months ago where the Taliban, the Afghan government was sitting down trying to figure out a way forward. And I think that's a good thing. It's the first we had seen in 20 some years. Um, but my support for the plan was also conditional, conditional in the sense that uh, we had these terms of agreement in the, in the agreement between the United States and Taliban. And we had implemented our side of it in good faith, but it's fair to say that the Taliban have not. Um, you know, the key parts being a reduction in violence, um, sitting down in good faith with the Afghan government and trying to negotiate a way forward. And of course, making a break with Al Qaeda. You know, at the end of the day, um, that's the most important part because at the end of the day, we went into Afghanistan uh, to ensure that that country would no longer be a safe haven for terrorists to attack the United States. And I don't think we should leave until we have confidence uh, that that is the case. And the premise of the Afghan deal was that they would come up with a, you know, a new governance model. And key to that would be ensuring to keep the, the terrorists out of the country. And that would give us a reason to leave. So, uh, you know, at this point, I, was, I, I made this clear when I was in the administration at the end. I, I, I thought we should hold it 4,500 until the conditions on the ground were met. Because at the end of the, end of the day, the two things, the two points of leverage we had over the Taliban was AR presence, and by the way, I shouldn't just say our presence because the NATO allies are there. And by the way, they're there in larger numbers than us, which is a testament to our, our alliance with, with them and the leadership of Jens Stoltenberg and others. But A, we had a uh, presence there that they didn't like. And B, we could we can inflict violence upon them. And we could do that by ourselves or in support of our Afghan partners. So lifting that, when you do that, you remove your leverage. So, uh, you know, the, the, 
the Biden administration is a tough position in terms of how they figure out the way forward. It, it needs to be done in close consultation with our Afghan partners and our and our Europeans and other allies on the ground. Uh, but I think that metric still holds is we have to make sure that, again, Afghanistan doesn't become a safe haven for terrorism. And I say that as somebody um, who wants to get that out, out of there as badly as anybody else. Um, you know, we're, we're spending five, six billion dollars a year there. We have troops rotating in and out. I, again, in the in the bigger issue of things on the plate, I see I'm more concerned about repositioning ourselves uh, for China and then for Russia. So um, and I've seen Afghanistan from the first year we were there all the way through the last year we were there. So that's generally my views on it. So there is this big question on nuclear command and control, and it's getting a little bit removed from the broader Middle East, except, of course, that if Iran ever did have a nuclear weapon, people in the Middle East are going to be very curious as to how U.S. extended deterrence may apply. So let me frame the question in those terms. Uh, and of course, I don't want this just, this just to be about the, the Trump administration experience, but more generally, we have a U.S. system in which the president through the Secretary of Defense could then transmit a command to a strategic command by which a nuclear attack could in theory be launched without any congressional role and without many people in that chain to potentially exercise restraint or caution. And again, I, I've had this question or this concern well before the Trump administration, so I don't want this to sound like a question about just one president. Did you come away from your experience with any similar concerns that maybe we need to rethink the checks and balances on potential US nuclear weapons usage in a crisis? Or do you think that the current system has enough safeguards and checks and balances to be dependable and, and safe uh, against all different kinds of possible concerns? So you have to go back and, and look at how the system emerged, right? And uh, I'm, I'm not a nuclear historian, and, and I'm sure somebody will catch me on something. But um, look, we, we knew that during the height of the Cold War that at any moment, if, if the Soviets attacked, um, time of flight of missiles, you'd have you know, 30 minutes to decide what to do. And you would or would not, depending on how you reacted, lose your second strike capability because the Russians could do a, a first strike. And so uh, that rationale ended up taking us toward mutual assured destruction. In other words, one side or the other wouldn't initiate a first strike because there was a guarantee that you could that the other could launch a second strike and therefore it would be a lose lose situation. Of course, any nuclear conflict is a, could be will be a losing situation. So uh, you, we still have those timelines today and those challenges. And um, I, 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 I I think there are enough safeguards in the system. There are enough trained people um, who, who know what that is. There's not one single button sitting there that goes all the way down to a, you know, a nuclear submarine carrying missiles or a silo or a bomber. There are a series of steps that have to be happen, and there are there are safeguards and all those things built in. So if you want to have a credible capability, certainly a second strike capability, it's not just the weapon systems. Uh, and you, of course, you know, we're modernizing the triad now. But the second point was you have to have a modern nuclear command and control system. Another, an, another um, feature, another important component of this system that we are also investing billions in to modernize as well. But the processes also have to be efficient. If the enemy knows that it's gonna take you, you know, hour, two hours or whatever the case may be to make a decision, then arguably they might presume you've lost that second strike capability. I don't know, I haven't thought through this much, but I, I am, I believe there are enough safeguards in place, checks and balances, et cetera, um, uh, to, to ensure you know, something uh, that, that the right decisions are made at the right time. And by the way, we, uh, it's hard to go back and find in history when a bolt from the blue like this might have happened. You know, if, if we get in a situation where we think nuclear weapons are going to be used, typically you have a lot of warnings and indications. Uh, those consultations have to begin. Um, you know, not just within the government, I'm, I'm sorry, within the executive branch, but with congressional leaders as well. So we all understand where this may, may head to and what may be called upon to do. But this, this authority is given to the president for this reason. And, it's, um, and it's, it's held well for years. It doesn't mean we shouldn't take a look at it, but I'm confident that, that we have safeguards, checks and balances in, system, in the system to do that. Well, that's a good note to finish on, as far as I'm concerned, because it's a nice word of reassurance. 
And also just want to thank you so much, Secretary Esper, again, for your uh, wisdom today and for all you did for our country in recent years, all you continue to do as you consider new walks of life and new uh, challenges ahead. So on behalf of everyone at Brookings, everyone as part of this conference, I want to, uh, and again, on behalf of myself and Natan Sachs and Suzanne Maloney and John Allen, uh, thank you very much for being with us today and for all you've done. So Thanks, signing Mike. off. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for hosting it. And the, uh, I want to thank the Brookings team for pulling it all together. It's uh, understand the conference has gone very well. So thank you all very much for bringing this together and for inviting me to join you. So we'll be signing off now for Brookings and wishing everyone the very best. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.